Hello, everybody. Uh, this is Brother Luke, Sin City Preacher. Welcome to this episode of Bible Talk with Brother Luke. Uh, tonight, I'm continuing with this character study of Job. We're working our way through the book of Job, and tonight we'll begin with chapter 22. Uh, if you think you're having deja vu, um, it could be true because I did attempt to do this same study uh, on October 31st. Uh, the problem was, being Halloween, I moved my computer back to a different room in the house away from my front door because I didn't want to be interrupted with trick-or-treaters. My, my wife's been out of town for months because she had to go back east because of a, a death in the family. So I'm here alone, and I didn't want to have to deal with all the trick-or-treaters. But when I moved into the other room, something technically wasn't right or something. I ended up really for the first 30 minutes uh, of the one-hour broadcast, uh, it was muted. Nobody could hear a word I said for 30 minutes. So I ended up removing that video, uh, and I'm going to attempt to do the whole thing over again tonight. Uh, if you got used to seeing Brother Eric here with me, uh, he's been on many of these broadcasts over the last couple of months. Uh, I don't expect to be here tonight. He might surprise me, but uh, he had to drive 300 miles today to go pick up his wife at the airport. Uh, she was she's been gone some time too and he, so i expect that uh, either he's worn out from that or the time does not permit him to join me but he may surprise me um all right i now before i go into chapter 22 and 23 and as far as i can get in an hour i, I think it's important to kind of uh, recap everything as concisely as i can because I realize that some people will be watching this video without the benefit of seeing the first, you know, 21 chapters of Job. Uh, and so you get this out of context. Um, I'm going to sum up the first 21 chapters and, and, and try to do it in a, a just one minute or two. Um, first of all, throughout this whole study, Job is unaware of what really is going on. Job was not privy to the conversation that Satan had with God. At the very beginning, in the first chapter and the second chapter, uh, it, where uh, Satan was looking around the world and trying to show that there's humanity is all horrible, and not worth God, God's time and, and, and love. And uh, God, God says, well, have you considered my servant Job? And J Job was uh, basically selected by God to say, here's an example of the, like the best. Check him out and you'll see there are some, some good people who love me. And, but yeah. Satan says, he only loves you because you bless him. He's really rich. He's got a, all these wonderful blessings. And let me take away his wealth and health and family as I take away those things you'll see that he only loves you because you bless him and, and he'll he'll curse you when everything's taking away so that's the setup for the whole book of Job but Job doesn't know what's going on Job uh, Job uh, thinks that it's God that's causing these bad things to happen and uh, he doesn't understand it because he thinks he's an innocent man. He doesn't think he's done anything to deserve, uh, you know, chastisement from God. And then Job eventually has three friends. They're not really friends, in my opinion. They're 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 je jealous, uh, you know, uh, self righteous uh, hypocrites that that they they come to visit Job, and you'd think that friends would be coming to encourage him and help him get through this. But all they do is accuse him and, and blame him and say, you're getting just what you deserve. Uh, so his, his, his friends are also not privy to the conversation between Satan and God. Uh, they are telling Job that all these bad things have happened to you because God's doing it to you to punish you because you're such a wicked person. So for quite a few chapters now, uh, We've seen a speech 
by one of Job's so-called friends. And the speech is a tirade, a, a diatribe, pointing the finger, accusing Job and blaming him, saying you're getting what you deserve. And then, then in the following chapter, Job makes a speech giving an answer to his friend's uh, you know, accusations. And it's been going back and forth like that for I don't know how many chapters, but uh, probably four, five, six, seven chapters we've had this going on, and, and this will continue. So uh, I'm going to kind of speed up this process, go through this more quickly till we get through that section, uh, because it's kind of more of the same. But let me read it. I'm a KJV first, just so I'll read it in the KJV first, uh, and then I'll analyze it by looking at the Amplified, because it amplifies it. So here we go, the KJV chapter 22. Then Eliphaz the Temanite answered and said, Can a man be profitable unto God as he that is wise may be profitable unto himself? Is it any pleasure to the Almighty that thou art righteous? Or is it gain to him that thou makest thy ways perfect? Will he reprove thee for fear of thee? Will, will he enter with thee into judgment? Is not thy wickedness great and thine iniquities infinite? For thou hast taken a pledge from thy, thy brother for naught and stripped the naked of their clothing. Thou hast not given water to the weary to drink, and thou hast withholden bread from the hungry. But as for the mighty man, he had the earth and the honorable man dwelt in it, Thou hast sent widows away empty, and the arms of the fatherless have been broken. Therefore, snares are round about thee, and sudden fear troubleth thee, or darkness that thou canst see, not see, and abundance of waters cover thee. Is not God in the height of heaven? And behold, the height of the stars, how high they are. And thou sayest, how doth God know? Can he judge through the dark cloud? Thick clouds are a covering to him that he seeth not, and he walketh in the circuit of heaven. Hast thou marked the old way which wicked men have tr trodden, which were cut down out of time, whose foundation was overflown with the flood? Which said unto God, Depart from us, and what can the Almighty do for them? Yet he filled their houses with good, good things, but the counsel of the wicked is far from me. Uh, the righteous see it and are glad, and the innocent laugh them to scorn. Whereas our substance is not cut down, but the remnant of them the fire consumeth. Acquaint now thyself with him, and be at peace. Thereby good shall come unto thee. Receive, I pray thee, the law from his mouth, and lay up his words in thine heart. If thou return to the Almighty, thou shalt be built up. Thou shalt put away iniquity far from thy tabernacles. Then shalt thou lay hold up, thou lay up gold as dust, and the gold of Ophir as the stones of the brooks. Yea, the Almighty shall be thy, thy defense, and thou shalt have plenty of silver. For then shalt, uh, thou, uh, shalt thou have thy delight in the Almighty, and shalt lift up thy face unto God, Thou shalt make the prayer unto him, and he shall hear thee, and thou shalt pay thy vows. Thou shalt also decree a thing, and it shall be established unto thee. The light shall shine upon thy ways. When men are cast down, thou shalt say, There is lifting up, and he shall save the humble person, and he shall deliver the island of the innocent, and it is delivered by the pureness of thine hands. Hey, Luke, yeah, I heard you. <clears throat> okay, brother. Did you hear the part where I said I read have to redo this because of the mute on the first half of the last time? <laughs> no, no, no. Okay. I said I have to redo that last study because uh, the first thirty minutes I, it was muted. I was uh, some malfunction. So I'm, I'm. But I'll be going through it more quickly because it's really more of the same. It's a it's a, a, a back and forth between uh, Job's accusers. Uh, and and Job's answer. So I'm going to be going through very quickly, but uh, uh, glad you could uh, join me tonight. How are you doing? Thank God, man. I'm happy to listen to you than anybody else on Google Plus right now, pretty much. So <laughs> if you know what I mean, some people get into it a little too much, and 
start being rude and arrogant with each other. But, you know, it's nice hearing a, 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 just a Bible study where there's no contention in there. You know, no conflict. It's not a it's not a competition. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, I I, I not only know what you're saying, but but my hangouts, the these broadcasts are designed to accomplish just what you said. Let's have fellowship, let's study and learn together, and um, uh, you you're only welcome here if you ag agree with the core doctrines of Christianity. And, and then on the minor doctrines, we, we may disagree on a lot of things, but we can talk it out and learn from each other. That's the premise of, of these broadcasts. And it is unlike than most of the hangouts that you see on, on YouTube. There's just nothing but all, all these different warring factions arguing, and it, get, it can get quite ugly. So I'm glad you're here for fellowship and study. Yeah, I see Eric ditched you tonight, huh? I was just joking with Eric. <laughs> uh, no, you must have joined me right after I talked about him. He had to drive 300 miles to pick up his wife at an airport today. She, she's she been out of, away from home for a month or so. So he's either still driving back and forth or, or he's maybe worn out or unavailable. I don't know. But uh, he told me last night that he was still going to be try to make this if at all possible. Um, okay, so you heard me read chapter 22, and um, it, as I said, this is more of the same. Uh, Job's so-called friend uh, is just continuing to condemn him. But what I got out of that tirade uh, from uh, Eliphaz is uh, he's saying, you are a wicked person, and that's why all this has happened to you. If you will repent... Uh, come back to the Lord and, and uh, change your ways, then God will bless you again. That's the sum up the whole chapter. And you know what I was thinking about as I was reading that? I have my own personal experience with that. Uh, you know, I don't know if you've seen me doing any street evangelism, but, you know, those videos, I you see me sitting in a wheelchair. Did you ever see any of those? I do recall something like that. I went through your channel real quick. I didn't actually watch uh, the video, but I think I know what you're talking about. Okay. I, uh, for several years, uh, I, I couldn't stand and preach uh, because of my uh, health condition. Uh, uh, I can stand and walk. I'm quite fit now. But for several years, I, I to go out and stand for you know, an hour or two in preaching was impossible. I could only stand for like a minute at a time. So I ended up having to preach from a wheelchair. And many times people would want to come and pray for me. And a lot of times I'd have these uh, um, faith, uh, uh, name it, claim it, uh, you know, uh, uh, what's the movement called? Faith, the faith, uh, uh, the people that believe that um, if, if you have enough faith, you will get blessed financially and you will be healed. I forgot the, the term for that group of people, but uh, there there's a lot of them out there. And, and so a lot of times people would come up to me and say, well, the reason you're here is because you've either got some sin in your life and you need to repent of that sin. And that's what Eliphaz was saying to, to Job. Uh, or they said, or uh, you've, your, your prayers are not answered because your faith is weak. You need more faith. And uh, so that's, uh, I, I've been kind of the victim of that kind of thing myself, where people are saying, uh, the only reason you're in a wheelchair is, is you've either got sin or, or, or no, not enough faith. I don't know if you've ever experienced this, these people. Oh, I have. Uh, I can relate. I can uh, sympathize with you, empathize, whatever it is. I've, I've been in a wheelchair quite some time all of my life, and uh, it, it's taken me a lot of prayer and power to get out of it, that's for sure. Uh, I never really got that nobody said anything like that to me, but I did think it myself. I was like, am I being punished? Why, God, why would you do this to me? That kind of feeling, you know. It was the second time I ended up in a wheelchair in 2012, and uh, in 2012 was when I finally just uh, gave up my life to Jesus Christ, and I converted, and whatever you want to say, and Something happened to me that I can't explain. I started to walk, and I think it was a miracle, kind of, or whatever, but uh, other people could disagree. That's okay. It's just uh, that's the way I was saved. That's the way I do. I believe I was saved is God reached out and helped me out of the wheelchair. So God bless you, you and, and your, your uh, endeavor with that, too. 
Hey, thank you. Well, I'm, I'm doing very well now. 2014 was extremely hard. I ended up having to have three surgeries and I was in and out of hospitals all year long with all kinds of complications, but that's, that was a hard year. But right now I'm, I'm just thrilled because everything is wonderful. Uh, physically and uh, you know my family everything's just wonderful so thank you Jesus I'm uh, just blessed beyond uh, I don't deserve it just thank you for your grace yeah amen to that I have been uh, called away for a minute I might be back in a little bit if you're still around all right join me if you can bye no problem okay uh, so that's how I sum up that chapter 22. It's more of the same. Eliphaz is saying, you're wicked. That's why this is happening to you. Repent, and then you, uh, re your relationship with God can be restored. But you see, Eliphaz doesn't know about the first two chapters of the book of Job. Job is not even aware of what's, uh, what's transpired. He doesn't fully un understand uh, why all this is happening either. Uh, so now I'm going to move on to the next chapter, 20, um, 23. <clears throat> I'm going to read it quickly in the KJV, and then I'll probably look at the Amplified as I go more carefully. Uh, this is Job's answer to Eliphaz. He says, Then Job answered and said, Even today is my complaint bitter. My stroke is heavier than my groaning. Oh, that I knew where I might find him that I might come even to his seat. I would order my cause before him and fill my mouth with arguments. I would know the words which he would answer me and understand what he would say unto me. Will he plead against me with his great power? No, but he would put strength in me. There the righteous might dispute with him. So should, should I be delivered forever from my judge. Behold, I go forward, but he is not there and backward, but I cannot perceive him. On the left hand, where he doth work, but I cannot behold him. He hideth himself on the right hand, that I cannot see him. But he knoweth the way that I take. When he hath tried me, I shall come forth as gold. My foot hath held his steps. His way have I kept and not declined. Neither have I gone back from the commandment of his lips. I have esteemed the words of his mouth more than my necessary food, but he is in one mind, and who can turn him and what his soul desireth, even that he doeth. And he performeth the thing that is appointed for me, and many such things are with him. Therefore I am troubled in his presence, when I consider I am afraid of him, for God maketh my heart soft, and the Almighty troubleth me. Because I was not cut off before the darkness, neither hath he covered the darkness from my face. Okay. Uh, let me sum it up in my own words first before I look at some specific verses there. Uh, he is, it's, it's almost like Jesus on the cross crying, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? He feels forsaken. Uh, have you ever done that? Have you ever prayed and you prayed and you just think God is not listening to you? Uh, I believe that every prayer is answered, but sometimes the answer is no. God says no. He has his reasons. Sometimes he says no for our own good, because what we pray for is not really what's best for us. Sometimes he says, wait, I can do that. I can help you with that, but not now. This is not the right time. Wait. Sometimes he says, yes, and you get your blessing. You get your answer. You get the, the your request, your su supply, your supplication is, is given to you. Um, but in this case, silence. Job is looking for God, looking for God that he loves desperately. And he can't find him on the right hand, the left hand, anywhere. And, uh, and he also says, uh, you're going, I know you're going to, if you examine me, if you look at me closely, I will come out as gold. He still 
understands, he believes that he is righteous. He is not guilty. He's, he doesn't deserve what's happening. He doesn't understand it, what's going on. His family is all killed. His wealth is destroyed. His health is ruined. He's suffering horrible pain. And all this is happening to him. And he, he doesn't believe that it's punishment from God for bad behavior for, because he deserves it. He thinks it's God doing it to him because he doesn't know that it's really the devil doing it to him. He doesn't know about the arrangement, the meeting between Satan and God in chapter one and two. Uh, but he doesn't believe that he deserves it. He believes if God tests him, try, tries him, uh, looks at him closely, he'll say, you come out as gold. So now let me look at this. I'm going to look at it in the Amplified, and just a few of these verses uh, a little more carefully. Okay. Um, he says, verse 4, I would present my cause before him and fill my mouth with arguments. I would learn the words which he would answer and understand what he would say to me. He would contend against me with his great... Would he contend with me against with his great power? No, surely he would give attention to me. There the righteous and upright could reason with him. So I would be acquitted forever by my judge. See, he believes he would be acquitted. He understands that he hasn't done something to deserve uh, being God discipline him, God uh, chastising him. His so-called friends say that, that you're getting what you deserve. Job understands, I'm not getting what I deserve. But he doesn't understand why. But he still has faith. He still believes God is just. And then uh, he says in verse 11, in verse 10, he says, but he knows the way I take, and he pays attention to it. When he has tried me, I will come forth as refined gold, pure and luminous. So Job is convinced that he's an innocent man suffering, but he's innocent. He says in verse 11, my feet have carefully followed his steps. I have kept his ways and not turned aside. Okay, so I'm going to go on now to chapter 25. I'll go back to the KJV. No, this is chapter 24. And it says, uh, let me look at this in the Amplified because they give me a title. I want to get their viewpoint of the title of this chapter. Let me see. Okay, uh, this is still Job talking now in chapter 24. And the title uh, is Job Says God Seems to Ignore Wrongs. I'll read it in the KJV first. Job says, why, seeing times are not hidden from the Almighty, do they that know him not see his days? Some remove the landmarks. They violently take away flocks and feed thereof. They drive away the ass of the fatherless. They take the widow's ox for a pledge. They turn the needy out of the way. The poor of the earth hide themselves together. Behold, as wild asses in the desert, they go forth to their work, rising betimes for a prey. The wilderness yieldeth food for them and for their children. They reap every one his corn in the field, and they gather the vintage of the wicked. They cause the naked to lodge without clothing, that they have no covering in the cold. They are wet with the showers of the mountains and embrace the rock for want of a shelter. They pluck the fatherless from the breast and take 
a pledge of the poor. They cause him to go naked without clothing, and they take away the sheaf from the hungry, which make oil with their walls and tread their winepress and suffer thirst. Men groan from out of the city, and the soul of the wounded crieth out. Yet God layeth not folly to them. They are of those that rebel against the light. They know not the ways thereof, nor abide in the past thereof. The murderer rising with the light killeth the poor and needy, and in the night is as a thief. The eye also of the adulterer waiteth for the twilight, saying, No eye shall see me, and disguiseth his face. In the dark they dig through houses, which they had marked for themselves in the daytime. They know not the light. For the morning is to them even as the shadow of death. If one know them, they are in the terrors of the shadows of death. He is swift as the waters. Their portion is cursed in the earth. He beholdeth not the way of the vineyards. Drought and heat consume the snow waters. So doth the grave those which have sinned. The womb shall forget him. The worm shall feed sweetly on him. He shall be no more remembered, and wickedness shall be broken as a tree. He evil, he evil entreateth the barren that beareth not, and doeth not good to the widow. He draweth also the mighty with his power. He riseth up, and no man is sure of life. Though it be given him to be in safety, where, whereon he resteth, yet his eyes are upon their ways. They are exalted for a little while, but are gone and brought low. They are taken out of the way as all other, and cut off as the tops of the ears of corn. And if it be not so now, who will make me a liar and make my speech nothing more? Okay, so that's verse 24 in the KJV, and that's still Job speaking. So um, they titled this chapter, the translators, the publishers of the Amplified Version, and they titled this chapter, Job says God seems to ignore wrongs. So in their opinion, that's the basic theme of this chapter here. Um, now I've said this before, but it's worth saying again that uh, we, we do not have the original scrolls that the book Job was written on, or for that matter, any of the 66 books in the Bible. We do not have the originals. We have copies of copies of copies. Uh, there are gener gen generations. Some are fairly close to the originals and some are farther away, but they're copies. I trust them. But in the originals and in the copies until we got to the printing press and we got to modern times, they did not have chapters, numbers. They did not have verse numbers. They did not even have punctuation. They did not have the capitalization or non-capitalization. They didn't have titles of chapters and subtitles for in, within the chapters. They didn't have any of that. That's all inserted by the publishers and the translators. And so we cannot use that and, and trust that the way we, act, we trust the actual words of scripture. I believe the scripture is the true word of God, but the chapter titles, uh, you know, it, it may be helpful, but, but it's man, it's fallible man. Maybe they're wrong when they give it a title. Maybe they're wrong when they uh, do their amplifying. But that's what I'm doing now, too. I'm just amplifying. Uh, as I read the scriptures and tell you what I think of it, I am commenting, expounding, amplifying. And that's why I like the amplified translation, because it's either one scholar or a group of scholars who have done this, doing the same thing I'm attempting to do right now. They're amplifying in their own words what the verses mean. So I look at the amplified translation really more as a, as a commentary. 
That's why I read the KJV first, so we get the scriptures, and then I look at the Amplified as I would read a commentary. But they say this title is Job says God seems to ignore wrongs. So let's read it carefully in the Amplified and see if the content backs up that title. It says, uh, 24 verse 1, Why does the Almighty not set seasons for judgment? Why do those who know him not see his days for punishment of the wicked? Well, we've talked about in the past, this in the past, that sometimes we see people that we, we know they're, they're dishonest, they're corrupt, they're just wicked in so many ways, and yet they prosper. Uh, we, we do know that there is a law that applies to the saved and the lost, and it, it's uh, what Jesus and Paul calls the uh, law of reaping and sowing. Uh, you know, when you do good things, you're going to get good results back. You reap what you sow. When you do bad things, you get bad results back. Like if I become a criminal and commit criminal acts, there's a good chance I'll get caught and I'll be punished in prison. So... I've reaped what I sowed. Uh, if I'm honest and hardworking and ambitious, and, you know, I'll probably have a successful life uh, financially. Uh, and if I'm, uh, if I abstain from smoking and drinking and drugs and and uh, and exercise and do all those things that are good for my health, I will probably reap what I've sowed. I will probably be more healthy. It may not be perfectly healthy because sometimes. Have you ever known someone that's done everything right and yet they get a horrible disease and they die way too too young or they're afflicted somehow? So it, it's not 100%, uh, but, but generally we can say we reap what we sow. But we also know that there are people that, why do they get rich? Why do they seem to have everything, everything so successful? Well, well, we talked about it before that... Uh, we're, we're really only thinking in terms of the 70 years, three score and 10, the scripture says that we get. Uh, some people live longer, some people live less, but say around 70 years is a lifespan. And uh, that is, scripture says, it's, it's like a, life is like a vapor. It appears for a short time and disappears. Uh, so when we think of eternity, the time that you have in this uh, mortal state here, in this temporal time, time frame uh, here on earth, it's, it's not even like one grain of sand on all the beaches of the world. That's how fractional your lifespan is. So what's really important is the things that are eternal. And that's what Jesus talks about building up treasures in heaven that last forever so that's where this law of reaping and sowing really really comes in and, and, and is perfect uh, but I'm going to go to verse 2 now it says some remove the landmarks they violently seize and pasture flocks appropriating lands and flocks openly they drive away the donkeys of the orphans they take the widow's ox for a pledge they crowd the needy off the road. The poor of the land all hide themselves. So he's talking about these wicked people that are wrongdoers, and they hurt people who, uh, who are, they are able to hurt, people who are weaker, less, less able to fend for themselves. These wicked people hurt them. Uh, two chapters ago, Eliphaz was saying that's what Job, describing Job as, as that. Saying, this is what you're doing, you've done. Well, I don't believe that's true because Job, did, Job denies it, and God also recommended him as being the best example of mankind. So, uh, yeah, but Job is saying, the, verse 5, Behold, as wild donkeys in the desert, the poor go to their work diligently seeking food, as bread for their children in the desert, they harvest their fodder in a field that is not their own and glean the vineyard of the wicked. And this is the, the plight of the poor. It's been this way for millennia. 
It's still that way today. Many people, uh, the, the people I know in America in the year 2015, this is the best of times in terms of prosperity. Look what I'm able to do here. I'm living in a comfortable home that is better than most palaces with in terms of running water and electricity and technology and whatever food I want is available at the grocery store. And all this stuff I have is more than, than the richest people in the world had centuries ago. Life is abundant. Life is easy right now in the United States at this time in history. But throughout history, it hasn't been that easy. And even today, there are people who are pushing over a tree stump to try to find some termites under there to eat. People like that today. So that's what Job is talking about, the, the plight of the poor. Verse 7, they spend the night naked without clothing and have no covering against the cold. They are wet from the rain of the mountains and cling to the rock for lack of shelter. Others snatch the fatherless infants from the breasts to sell or make them slaves. That's still going on today. I mean, many places around the world, I know this is not uncommon in Africa, in the Middle East. And against the poor, they take a pledge of clothing. They cause the poor to go about naked without clothing, and they take away the sheaves of grain from the hungry. Within the walls of the wicked, the poor make olive oil. They tread the grapes in, the wine press, but thirst from the populous and crowded uh, city. Uh, men groan, and the souls of the wounded cry out for help. Yet God seemingly does not pay attention to the wrong done to them. Others have been with those who rebel against the light. They do not want to know its ways, nor stay in its paths. The murderer rises at dawn. He kills the poor and the needy. And at night he becomes a thief. The eye of the adulterer waits for the twilight, saying, no eye will see me and he covers his face. In the dark, they dig into the penetrable walls of houses. They shut themselves up by day. They do not know the light of day. For the, for the morning is the same to him as the thick darkness of midnight, for he is familiar with the terrors of thick darkness. They are insignificant on the surface of the water. Their portion is cursed on the earth. They do not turn towards the vineyards. Drought and heat consume the snow waters. So does Sheol, the netherworld, the place of the dead, consume those who have sinned. A mother will forget him. The worm feeds on him until he is no longer remembered. And wickedness will be broken like a tree which cannot be restored. He preys on the barren childless woman and does no good for the widow. Yet God draws away the mighty by his power. He rises, but no one has assurance of life. God gives them security and they are supported and his eyes are on their ways. They are exalted for a little while and then they are gone. Moreover, they are brought low and like everything, they are gathered up and taken out of the way. Even like the heads of grain, they are cut off. And if this is not so, who can prove me a liar and make my speech worthless? One of the things that is spectacular about the book of Job is the language. Yeah. Not only Job's speeches, uh, but even his accusers, they are eloquent. And unfortunately, I've said this before, but this is so important, I will repeat it. 
I made a video titled on Lordship Salvation Liars. And I said, do not let them deceive you with their eloquence. There are some famous pastors today, televangelists, they, are, they have giant churches, they're authors, they give lectures, they have seminaries, but they're teaching lies. Calvinism, Lordship Salvation, MacArthur, Piper, Washer, Ray Comfort. I've named them all in videos. They eloquently speak their philosophies. And some people get caught up in the drama, the eloquence of their speech. And, and Paul warned us about it, about don't be deceived by someone's speech. He says, I, I don't speak that beautifully. Paul says, I don't have good speech. When, I, when I'm there in front of you, I know I'm not very impressive in person. That's why I write these letters, he said, because I can, I can make my point better by writing it than speaking. Uh, but that's one of the things that stands out to me in this book is the eloquence of his accusers, but what they're saying is false. And then, of course, Job was equally eloquent too, but he understands God. I hope you go back and watch this study from the beginning, from chapter one, so you can understand that Job, uh, really, uh, his faith is the same as ours, except he doesn't know the name Jesus. He doesn't hasn't seen the, the cross and the resurrection, but, but his, his faith is that God is gracious, and if I put my faith in him, he forgives my sins and he gives me eternal life in heaven. That's clear in Job. That's his belief system. It's by grace alone, through faith alone, and God alone. Later on, this God that we put our faith in, is it's clarified. We find out it's Jesus is our Savior God. And we learn about what he's done for us and his promises. Let me go on to the next chapter here. Oh. It's, it's 7.42. Let me see if I have how this next chapter looks here. 25. Oh, it's a short chapter. So I, I'll, I'll go ahead and fin do that one. Uh, I'll read the KJV first. Now this is Bill Dad's answer back to Job. Chapter 25, verse 1, KJV. Then answered Bildad the Shuhite and said, Dominion and fear are with him. He maketh peace in his high places. Is there any number of his armies? And upon whom doth not his light arise? <clears throat> how then can man be justified with God? Or how can he be clean that is born of a woman? Behold, even to the moon, and it shineth not. Yea, the stars are not pure in his sight. How much less man that is a worm, and the son of man which is a worm. <clears throat> well, my first reaction to that is all true, Bill Dad, all true. That's why uh, if we were judged by God on our own merit, on our based upon our behavior, our performance in life, we would all fall short. As he says, we're no better than a worm. That's all true. But Bildad doesn't understand the, the, uh, the as Job does, about faith in God. And one of the things I keep repeating is the line that Job said in a few chapters back, he says, uh, because of his faith in God, God has taken all of Job's sins and put them in a bag and sewn it shut. That's the same thing I believe as a, as a Christian. 
think he's taking all my sins, charge it to Jesus. And he says, my sins and iniquities, he will remember no more. He cast my sins as far as the east is from the west. That's Jesus on the cross. That's your sins are not here anymore. So I can't argue with um, Bill Dad's point, but it's incomplete. That's our situation. That's why we need to be saved. Let me read that in the Amplified now. Bildad says man is inferior is the title. Then Bildad the Shuhite answered and said, Dominion and awe belong to God. He establishes peace and order in his high places. Is there any number to his vast celestial armies? And upon whom does his light not rise? How then can man be justified and righteous with God? There's the question in verse 4. That's the question we all must ask. How can we be justified and considered righteous with God? We can't. Every one of us is a failure. Scripture says, if you say you have no sin, you deceive yourself and the truth is not in you. That's the first thing we all must understand. Is we're all sinners. But if you think that you can get to heaven because you've done more good than sin, your good outweighs your sin, well, you're deceived. God does not use the merit system. He doesn't have a balanced scale saying, give me more good than bad and you get in. No. If you've done anything bad, you're disqualified. Anything wrong. Do you ever lie, cheat, steal, hate, envy, covet? See, it's not only things you do, it's even your thoughts. Did you ever fail to help someone who needed your help? A sin of omission. We've all sinned. We're, we all fall short of the glory of God. And the scripture says the wages of sin is death. The proof that we're all sinners is that we all die. And then we get judged by God, and we're found that we're uh, we're not worthy, and we we are we die the second death in the lake of fire. That's why you need to be saved. That's why I need to be saved. We need to understand that we're helpless. We can't make ourselves perfect. It's too late. You've already sinned. It's you know you're a sinner out just like me. But what our sins were put on Jesus on the cross. He paid for our sins. That's what you need to understand. Thank Jesus. Say, thank you so much, Jesus. Hallelujah. All glory and praise to Jesus. You died for my sins. Because of that, you can be reconciled with God. You come to Jesus Christ. And he's like on that cross. His arms are outstretched. He's waiting to embrace you and hold on to you and never let you go. Never leave you or forsake you give you life everlasting in heaven. He promises you, you will live forever in heaven. If you'll let, come to him, he will get a hold of you. He says, I have you in the palm of my hand and I will never let you go. So Bill Dad says in verse four, how then can man be justified and righteous with God? Well, the answer is, you can be justified and considered righteous with God if you put your faith in Jesus and stop thinking you can get to heaven on personal merit. Believe on Jesus instead. Then he said, or can, how can he who is born of a woman be pure and clean? Well, the only way is you must be born a second time. That's what Jesus said. When you're born the first time out of your mother's womb, you were born wrong. You were born as a sinner, and you were, it's inevitable. You sin. We all sin. You've sinned thousands of times, hundreds of thousands of times in your life, and that's what we do. It's our nature. That's why we need to be born again, born a second time, born spiritually from above, Jesus said. And we are born again spiritually when we put our faith in Jesus. He sends his spirit to unite with our spirit, bring our spirit to life, and we're spiritually alive and we're a child of God forever and in verse 5 he says behold even the moon has no brightness compared to God's majesty and glory and the stars are not pure in his sight how much less man 
that maggot, the son of man, that worm. Okay, that's verse 25. I'll pick up with verse 26. Let me write that down. Job 26 is where I'll pick up next time. Um, but that leads us right into the gospel, and you've pretty much got the gospel. The gospel is a Greek word. It means good news. And the good news is that even though we're a sinner doomed to go into the, the, the lake of fire suffering a second death, uh, we can be saved from that uh, by believing on Jesus. I want you to know who he is and what he's done for you. Jesus is eternal God Almighty. He's not a creature. He did not have a beginning. He's eternal. And Jesus was God manifest in the flesh. Uh, the word God became flesh and dwelled among us. He lived on the earth. And he said the reason he became a man was, he says, I came to give my life as a ransom for many. The reason he became a man was so he could die. He had to become a man to die. He had to die on that cross so he could pay for all our sins. The sins of all mankind throughout all of history were put on Jesus on that cross. That's why the Father looked away and forsook him because, because he, it was the sin of all mankind right there. And Jesus said, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Because all our sins were put on Jesus. He paid for it. But the good news is, he died on that cross and was buried, but on the third day, he raised himself from the dead. He did that so he could prove to us that he is God and he has the power over life and death. And he promises if you put your faith in him, he will raise you back to life. If you died right now, there's a time in the future where he says, I will, there will be a resurrection of the just and the unjust. The just are those people who are justified because of their faith in Jesus, who are raised back alive with these bodies, but perfect, never to get sick or die or suffer or pain, no more tears, a perfect glorified body like Jesus had after his resurrection. He'll raise us, that's the resurrection, and we get to go to heaven and live forever together with him. In the new heaven, the new earth. And yet, the other people who did never put their faith in Jesus, they also get resurrected. It's the resurrection of the unjust. They're resurrected so that they can go to the judgment and say, plead their case. And all that's going to be said to them is, Jesus died for your sins, but you wouldn't trust him. Therefore, your faith is the second death. You did not have life everlasting. He offered it to you, but you wouldn't put your faith in him and receive it. So the second death is waiting for you. And don't be resurrected into the second death. Be resurrected into life everlasting by putting your faith in Jesus. Do it now, and then make a comment and let me know. All right, join me uh, nightly at 7 p.m. Pacific time. And uh, tomorrow, I don't know what I'll study. We're, I'm kind of alternating between Job, Proverbs, the book of John, and uh, early church history. So uh, bless you all in the name of our great Savior God. His name is Jesus Christ.